All right, I am recording this, you guys, just so you know. So if you do ask a question, it will be on my video. You are not on video. I am on video. Here's my camera where I'm recording. So thank you so much for coming. My name is Valinda. I know most of you. Most of you. And how did you hear about this? Your husband, right, Diane? Yes, he's okay. right on the flyer. He's a member here. So people are on the flyer. Wonderful. So everybody else, and I'm... This um, is my mother, Lynn. Lynn, welcome. And Grace invited me, and so I'm very excited. Well, to I'm so happy you're here. Yoga 101. She's been doing yoga for a few years. Oh. Back at the um, Mother Center. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Nice. I think that was it. Wonderful. Well, welcome, welcome, Lynn. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We do have an hour. Uh, if I can go a little bit over, because they went over in the class before us, if everybody's okay with that, I will. I'll go an hour from now, because my husband's picking up the girls. <laughs> so perfect. I'm glad he was off today. So I just want us to get centered right quick, because that's what I do. <laughs> that's what I teach. So wherever you are, just come sitting up tall. Let's get present. Let's turn this a little. All right, so let's just take our shoulders up to our ears. Inhale, exhale, roll the shoulders back. Inhale up, exhale back. And one more, inhale up, exhale back. Good, and just reaching your fingertips towards your knees, close your eyes, and just come into a long, deep breath. Feel yourself very present in your body just as you are this afternoon. Inhaling and exhaling. And begin to just clear the clutter of the mind. Ask yourself to be fully present. You can imagine yourself sitting in the center of your head. Just see light all around you, knowing you're safe here, that you can rest, you can lay down, you can get comfortable, you can ask a question, um, that this is a very informal Q&A about Yoga 101 and what yoga is. Good. Well, let's just bring our hands together. Press the palms. So this is Anjali Mudra, pressing the palms together, balancing the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Let's take a big inhale and hold the breath. Press the thumbs. And exhale, release. Good, and open your eyes. So you just did yoga. Oh. <laughs> I had a woman in the um, <coughs> lobby tell me, right, I asked, are you coming to Yoga 101? And she's like, no, I'm intimidated by yoga. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing this class. I'm doing it because I have about 35 people that come to my morning class uh, here on uh, 9 o'clock on Wednesdays. And they're like, Valinda, we really want to know about the stuff you talk about in class. And I'm like, well, I'm busy teaching a class, and it's really hard for me to talk about <laughs> yoga philosophy when I'm trying to teach asana. Because yoga philosophy is different from asana. Anybody know what asana means? <laughs> posture, right. Uh, posture. So the asanas are the postures. So that's what we think of as yoga in the West. We think yoga and we think yoga journal, right? That's what I think. Maybe even the whole crazy getting the leg behind the head and the crazy postures too, yeah? Right, okay, well, yoga is not that. It couldn't be further from that. It's actually one aspect of yoga. So I was telling Kathy in the um, lobby that I was thinking, oh, everybody's asking me about doing yoga 101 and I'm just gonna throw a little presentation together, a little two-page two handout and yeah, it'll be fun. Okay, seven pages, 22 hours later, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> so, and, I, and then as I'm walking out the door, I'm like grabbing all my books because I want to share so much with you guys. I want to share everything I've been studying for 23 years, which is impossible to do in an hour. But um, you can see that I'm super passionate about this, and it's really important for me to teach yoga what, what yoga really is and to really dispel the myths of yoga so I started digging and digging and digging and oh my god, I was going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole after rabbit hole. So the main um, article that was pretty 
pretty amazing was by one of my teachers who his name is Julian Walker it is on the last page of your sheet I put his website and I studied with him for years I want to give him lots of kudos because he did a lot of research he wrote a 29 page paper and it's actually got published in um, 21st century yoga is the name of the book if you want to get the book and also the other book that was pretty amazing um, with the most kind of cutting edge stuff and information is by Mark Singleton, The Yoga Body. So I want to give them lots of kudos because they are scholars. We, Julian has been studying um, yoga meditation, um, movement therapy and things like that for 30 years, so about 10 years longer than me <coughs> because he was my teacher. He's one of my many, many teachers. I have many, many teachers. Um, but he's one of them, so I want to give him lots of kudos. So I have his website in the back. If you want to read the 29-page article, you can. I, I did not, I left a lot out because it's just too much information. And I also bought, brought a few little trees. They're up here if you absolutely want one, but it is just so much information. I was going to go over this with you guys, but it's like, no. This is for scholars. This is like, this is like every single branch of yoga, where it went off to. There's no way to talk about all of the history of yoga in one hour. So I'm gonna give you guys the general introduction of what it is, and also the latest cutting edge research. So that's why Grace came. Grace has been one of my students for probably 15 years now. She just finished her level one training in Kundalini. Have you done any level twos? Um, I did. One level three. <laughs> but that's that's a tough one. That was my fifth one. It was that was one of the toughest. It ones. was tough. <laughs> yeah, like you go into a level, a, a, you know, a level two Kundalini training, and people go, "Oh, you must have learned really advanced postures." I'm like, uh, "Yeah, no, we didn't. We meditated for like <laughs> three hours <laughs> and never moved. Like, wow. so, no, no, it was all meditation." So. Uh, so this is the Hatha Yoga family tree, yes. So if you want one, I did bring a few. And you can grab it at the end of class because there's no way I can go over this. But this is the tree. And this isn't even everything, you guys. This isn't even everything. So I am not going to read the handout to you. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm using it as a guide. And I would like to go around and... Um, just say, you know, maybe how many years you've been doing yoga, what kind of yoga you've been doing, and why you came to this workshop. So we'll start with Catherine. Let me get my water. Oh, I'm Catherine. Um, I, I've done a few, like, park and rec yoga, never um, really consistent, and then I joined this gym, and Wednesday mornings have left my body feeling so amazing and my mind. And I just love Belinda, and I just, I'm like a sponge. Everything she talks about, I just want to know more. So Aww. I'm ready. Makes want my more. heart warm. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank uh -huh. you for coming. Heidi? Hi. Day. Hi. Oh, I had a so your days. name, too. Oh, um, my name is Heidi. <laughs> and um, I've had a few classes here and there. I've uh, read a little bit about it. I have a friend from India who did yogi, mm -hmm. a younger, young, young lady. Um, so uh, when one of my friends, Farah, told me about you, I tried the class and then I joined the gym mainly for that. And um, so um, I love your classes as well and um, I'm very interested in just the whole idea behind it. I've done some research myself, but when you said you had a class here, I have to look. Yeah, I did all the work for you. Yeah. I love you. You just show up. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Julie, and I dabbled in yoga classes, and when I was younger, it was just, I could not sit there. I like, would not hold my attention. I felt like, I've gotta be doing things. I'm so, you know, things to do, I can't be sitting here doing this. But when I tried the Kundalini class, actually I did a few other ones, because I love Pilates, and so I kind of mixed up. <coughs> I loved the Kundalini class so much, and I kind of wanted to know, what are chakras? What, like, I know nothing about any of this, so mm -hmm. I really want to know. What it all means. Yeah. Okay. That's the mic. Okay. It's not a video camera. <laughs> you want to go, Donna? My name is Donna. So you've been doing Kundalini now for almost a year. The first class, I knew it was for me. I really just knew it was for me.
That's the goal of yoga. You're doing it right. <laughs> about 20 years ago um, and I've been to teaching Kundalini I found out when I started going to Belinda's classes so I've been going to Belinda's classes mm -hmm. for about a year and it's, it's been great so my name is Lisa and I think I've been doing Kundalini about what, four months and uh, my world was crashing in and found you in the lobby and um, mm -hmm. it's just been great for me I love it <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Mike, and my first exposure to yoga was in 1970. It was Kundalini. It was taught by Yogi Bhajan, and um, mm -hmm. I did it extensively in college, and then uh, the world caught up. I did a bunch of other things, and I kept leaving and coming back. I did uh, Bikram and Ha Yoga and Yangar, basically what you would call gym yoga, vinyasa flow. And enjoyed that as well. I like all yoga, I love all yoga, but um, I like the spiritual component you find in Kundalini. And I'm here um, to support Belinda and my yoga teachers. We're so fortunate to have it available here at the Bay Club. And um, <clears throat> yeah, and I love to do uh, group. The group energy is, is wonderful. So I practice a lot on, on uh, if you practice at home alone, you know the difference between having a group and doing it by yourself. So it's just wonderful to be here. Thank you, Mike. Hi, I'm Lynn, and I've kind of gone in and out of yoga for years, and was always impressed by um, peers of mine who seem to age so richfully with uh, yoga. And my I'm husband- I'm 83. <laughs> <laughs> Still the ghost to show. <laughs> <laughs> I need yoga. Uh, uh, my husband was very uh, engrossed in Kundalini, and I attended some classes with him. And uh, Grace has certainly, uh, you know, it has, I know, enriched her life. And so I'm just here to learn a little more. Wonderful. Very nice. Thanks for coming. Uh, well, you already heard about me, Grace, but uh, <coughs> I will say I studied with Belinda for years, and. Um, now I teach um, Kundalini in prison, and I just feel like it's just such a rich um, tradition. The more I know, the more I want to know. And Belinda's so great. When I heard she'd done 22 hours preparing, I wanted to be there. <laughs> <laughs> she texted me before. She's like, oh my God, I have to come. <laughs> I'm Diane. Um, I've never had a yoga class at all. I recently re recovered from a couple of injuries, and it's time for me to get moving and flexible. And I try at home, but I thought Belinda could help me. Yeah, perfect. I'm Kathy, and I have also dabbled in many types of yoga for, I'm not sure, 20, 30 years, um, but was turned on to Kundalini probably around five years ago through both um, Belinda and another couple in San Pedro. And um, I was drawn towards the deeper knowing of yoga, like what she's presenting today. So I've been doing, um, this year I did six months through LMU where they offer a master's in yogic philosophy. So if anybody's interested in that, it's, there's no, um, you don't bring your yoga mat. It's just hardcore book studies and in-depth just breaking apart Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads and sutras down verse by verse so it was and those fascinating are like the masters over there at lmu those guys are the stud guys who studied with these guys yes wow. because yeah. yoga la is the mecca of yoga and i'll tell you guys a story about that yeah so love yeah. kundalini and love belinda so thank you me um hi i'm laura um i remember as a young girl my mom used to do yoga um with richard Hiddleman. I have his tape. I have his VHS. <laughs> yeah, and then I always was drawn to it because I love the balance of working my body, stretching, and then releasing stress. And I actually took Kundalini 
uh, yoga works with Ame yeah. mm. many, many times, but that, now I don't have a membership there anymore because I moved back to the Taylor So, But um, I just want to learn, and I love everything about yoga, and, and I very, feel very grateful that I have you as my teacher here, and Carol, and all this, all, all this club all rolled into one with all the yoga and everything. It's great. So, I like it. And Megan, um, I've probably done yoga for, or dabbled in and out of the yoga scene for 10 years now. Um, and I've always really connected with the breath work and the chanting side of yoga. Um, and I just always love to learn more. So I'm excited. Wonderful. Well, thanks for coming. I just met Megan. Kathy brought her. So welcome, welcome. All right. So let's dive right in. So starting with um, the word yoga, that's how can you get more basic than that, right? So we, most of us know now, it's um, from the root of the word yug, yuj, which means to yoke, to join. It's from the, uh, the English word yoke, to join, to unite, sub to subjugate, with the meaning to control and to discipline. So yoga is about discipline, and it's, it's a Sanskrit word. So the first mention of yoga, and not the way we understand it today. So remember, when we in the West think yoga, well, we think of all the postures and the pretty postures in the magazines, right? But yoga, when it first began, it's what they were talking about is they were talking about pranayama, so the breathing techniques, mudras, which are the hand gestures, or there also can be body position, positions that are mudras which mudra just means seal of energy. So when we do this yoga mudra in my, one of my classes where we take our hands behind our back and we put the middle finger and the thumb around the wrist and we're in child's pose. So we're pressing our forehead in the ground. It's creating energy, a figure eight basically, a seal of energy that's moving energy in a very specific way. So really yoga, they're talking about the mudras. The, the posture is the seated posture and they're talking about the breath Prana and Yama. Prana means life force. Yama is that technique. And the bandhas. Anybody want to give a stab at what a bandha is? You guys know if you come to my classes. A lock. A lock. So we're squeezing. We're literally squeezing our bodies to get into specific postures and also to move energy. So we're trying to move the energy from the lower chakras to the higher chakras. Okay? So when they're talking about yoga, the first mention of yoga is in the Vedas. Veda means knowledge. These are the oldest, most sacred ancient texts, right? The Vedas. So 700 BCE. So this is 3,700 years ago. So people say yoga is, it's funny because I don't want to name names, but I've done a lot of teacher trainings, a lot. In one of my teacher training books, the first page is yoga is a 5,000 year old tradition. Where did that come from? Because I have the mind, <laughs> I'm, I tell you guys in my Kundalini class, if you tell me something, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put that to the test. I'm a yoga, I want to experiment with it. I want to know why, I want to know how. Like, I have that, you can see. I have that, like, where, and where did that come from, and why? So the, the first mention of yoga, and not even in the way that we, that we know is yoga, was 3,700 years ago, not 5,000 years ago. But we hear it all the time, right? Oh, yoga is a 5,000-year-old tradition. And the only posture that they have any record of, <laughs> anybody know what it is? I say it all the time in my classes. What is the only posture they have any record of? Not just awesome, that would be good. This one. Not even lotus. Easy pose. It's called sukhasana. Asana literally means seat. That's the original meaning of the word, seat. But it became to mean posture, asana's posture, because the Sanskrit words got connected. So sukhasana, easy pose. Baddha konasana, bound angle. So all the words we use are from Sanskrit because the Vedas are written in Sanskrit. So the Veda, Vedas are these huge body of knowledge, you guys. Like I can't even begin to tell you what the, what the Vedas are because it's so vast. And I started reading it, the Rig Veda and the Yajur Veda and the Sama Veda. And you're probably studying this at LNU, correct, Kathy? Mm -hmm. So Kathy's studying all of this and her yoga philosophy. And each Veda has been subclassified into four major text types. 
So there's all these different types of the Vedas, of this knowledge. So discussing meditation, philosophy, spiritual knowledge, ceremonies, sacrifice. So worship. And so the Hindus adopted the Vedas. So this is 3,700 years ago as the basis of their teachings. And they created six schools. And yoga was one of the schools. So when people say yoga is Hinduism, it kind of is. <laughs> it came from that knowledge. But Hinduism means the way. It's a way of studying knowledge, of gaining knowledge, of spiritual things, of <coughs> what these sages, so these, these sages wrote this down. So they say, just similar to the, I think the Bible says this, don't quote me on this. Who's good at the Bible stuff? Anybody scholar in the Bible stuff in here? Um, yeah, don't quote me on this, but I think what they say that the God realized beings wrote the Bible. Is that correct? Okay, well, I don't know, so I'm not, don't quote me on that. <laughs> but um, that's the thing about recording everything, right? It's on video for the rest of my life. <laughs> but so God realized beings wrote the Vedas. That's, they say they channeled Brahma. Brahman is where the Vedas came from. These sages, these sages, these saints wrote this knowledge. And it is this very powerful knowledge, very powerful knowledge. And we do learn a little bit of that in Kundalini. So basically, it's that six yoga branched off as one of the schools of Hinduism. Yoga meaning to join, to unite, because it comes from a dualistic approach. So what is the dualistic approach? And I don't know the Sanskrit name for that. Kathy might. Is it Sam, Samkhya? Samkhya. Samkhya. So what are we using? What are we yuging? What are we uniting? Like, what does that really mean? Like, what were the sages talking about? What do I have to unite? Well, what Yogi Bhajan says. So that's my main school of yoga is Kundalini. He says our finite consciousness with our infinite consciousness, which means your soul. So it's under the presumption that we have a soul, right there. Do you have to believe that to practice yoga? My next workshop's gonna be Kundalini Yoga without beliefs. No, you don't. You don't have to believe anything to practice yoga. And like I said, I came in with the mind. I told you guys I have a strong negative mind because I question everything and I want to know why, why, why. And then I'm going to do it, do it, do it. Prove it, prove it, prove it. <laughs> so it comes in with that assumption that we're not connected to our soul. And we have a soul. So what if you don't even believe you have a soul? My sister's an atheist. She's... She doesn't even really believe we have a soul. So why should she even practice yoga? If the whole goal of yoga is to merge with your soul and you don't believe you have a soul, why are you going to do yoga? Well, she does it to get rid of her lower back pain. That's okay. That's okay. So yoga has four main paths. Any questions so far? Sorry. Yes, please. So um, to unite your soul with what? Your finite consciousness, okay. which is your human form, okay. with your infinite con consciousness, which is your soul. And they call it in Hinduism and in the sixth school of yoga, the sixth school of Hinduism, which is yoga, they call it Atman. So it's assuming that... The human form is Atman. No, that's your soul. Atma or Atman is soul. Merging your human form, your ego, your finite consciousness. Because we don't, and I told you guys, Yogi Bhajan would say, it breaks my heart because you don't realize who you are. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. You don't know, who, wake up, wake up, wake up. Because he, he wasn't a guru, but he was a master. So he was a realized being. I've heard stories, I never met him in person, but I've heard stories of all of these gurus that you would walk in the room. Some people say they would fall to their knees. Is that the highest level guru? Or is there anything about that? A guru is a God-realized being okay. on earth. An avatar. I would say Babaji is probably the highest. Yeah. Babaji? <clears throat> guru is not the highest. Okay, guru is not the highest. So, yeah. Kathy, please explain that. Um, I don't remember the hierarchy, but uh, anyone can be a guru. It's in the form of a teacher that dispels 
the darkness. So you're anyone that enlightens others, you are a guru. And it's a, it's a form of being a teacher. Okay, so that, that which takes us from yeah. darkness to light. And then, yeah, and guru, then, guru means dark, guru means light. Yeah, like right. Raja. But like Yogananda, you guys, he was a guru. He was a master. He was a God-realized being. I'm nowhere near this. <laughs> but, but, so but that's, that's what they, I think of as guru. They had the hierarchy of the royalty, so they had like Raja. And he was, right. Was royalty they had that the was only Brahmins. Amongst the, the elite royalty. Right. The gurus were not part of that royalty, so it was, there is different categories, you know, tastes. Uh, uh, okay. So there's only been so many gurus in, in, that have incarnated on this planet, true gurus. And Yogananda was definitely one of them, Paramahansa Yogananda. Yogi Bhajan never claimed to be a guru. He said, I'm not your guru. The teachings are the guru. That makes better sense to me because I was on the Ananda path for a while and they were trying to get me to accept Yogananda as my guru and take a vow and become a Kriyaban and that's a whole other path. But, and they wanted me to take a vow to do a practice for the rest of my life and they wouldn't teach me the practice. I'm like, how can I take a vow to do a practice? So this is discerning mind, right? How can I take a vow to do a practice for the rest of my life and I don't even know what that practice is? Hell no! <laughs> There's my southern girl coming out. <laughs> so I, it actually, I was on the Ananda path for a while and it actually threw me back deeper into Kundalini. That's when I started my level twos in 2010. So that's a whole other story. So four paths of yoga. We have Raja Yoga. So this is the Kingly Yoga, the yoga of the self based on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which I will get into later. So he wrote Yoga Chitta Vritti Naro. That's kind of the most common sutra that we know out of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, 195, 96. I read two different things last night, 195, 196 Yoga Sutras, which means phrases that he wrote about yoga. He was a sage. So yoga calms the chatter of the mind. Raja Yoga focuses on the eight limbs as a practice. Physical practice is highlighted, seeing the self and the body as sacred, perfecting oneself. That's the path of the Raja Yogi. So that's what we know in the West, that one path. And even more of a sect of that, just the asana, because we're going to learn the eight limbs in a minute. The second path of a yogi is a bhakti yoga, and that's the yoga of devotion, yoga of love, yoga for the masses, religious in nature. Think Hare Krishna's. Foundation is faith and worship, practicing, listening, observing, chanting, ceremony, prayer, emotional in nature, adores the divine and all. That's when you have a guru. You worship the guru. The guru's on the altar. You, you give them flowers every day. You pray to your guru. That's very bhakti, very devotional. Kundalini yoga is a very bhakti yoga. Why? Because what are we doing? Satna. Truth is my name. 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 Adi shakti. Adi shakti. Adi. It's very devotional. It's very emotional in nature, right? So it appeals to me, right? It appeals to me because I'm emotional in nature. So bhakti, that's the path of the bhakti yogi. The jhana yogi is the yoga of wisdom, knowledge, studying, writing, seeing, being, observing, questioning, practices self-study. Svadhyaya, Svadhyaya, is that how you say it, Kathy? <laughs> Kathy's studying Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. Vichara, inquiry. Viveka, discrimination. Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya. Varigya, non-attachment. The mental practice is highlighted, sees freedom and knowing and becoming deprogrammed. So this is what I was doing the last all week. I've been studying, studying, pulling stuff, pulling stuff. You know, what is yoga? What is yoga? The history of yoga. So I, I was a jhana yogi all week. I've been really studying. I'm, I have all of these. I think we all have all of these, right? Um, in the West, we're lucky enough to get to, you know, learn it all. And the karma yoga is the yoga of right action, selfless serving. We call it seva. Seva is serving without expecting anything in a return, giving oneself to serve it. Service, serving leads to God. Karma yogis devote their entire lives to serving humanity. Everything is God and an active practice is highlighted like Mother Teresa, Gandhi, or karma yogis. And even at uh, festivals, at Kundalini Yoga festivals, Hatha yoga, they say, oh, I'm a karma yogi. That means you're serving at the festival. I'm doing my karma yoga. Right. So those are the four paths of yoga. So Hatha yoga, the, the asanas, are under Raja. One little, it's one little step under Raja, so that's it. All right, so back to the Vedas, where it all began. 
The chief belief of the Vedas, ancient sacred texts, is the belief that existence of Atman, or the immortal soul, and in the world beyond the one we inhabit, and how do we find our soul? So there is a purpose to the Vedas, the knowledge, studying the knowledge. It's <coughs> saying that we are separate from God. And there's a story about that, about Maya. And Maya is the goddess of, um, help me out, Maya is the goddess of illusion. And she, there's a story in, uh, in Hinduism, and she goes to Brahma, the god Brahma, and she says, I want to play a game. And he's like, well, why? And she's like, well, I'm bored. I'm bored with existence. I'm bored with all this stuff that we created. So Prakriti, the created earth. So Brahma created everything. So God created everything. And Maya says, why don't we play a game? And he's like, well, what's the game? And she's like, well, you have to agree to play it, and then we'll play it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's like, OK. So she cuts him up into thousands and billions of pieces, and she puts him in every human. And she goes, now go find yourself. <laughs> so that's the story. So all of us have a piece of God within us, Brahma. So. Now we have to find, we have to remember, we have to remember that. So it is a dualistic approach. God is there, I am here, I am on earth, I am separate from God. And then the, they say, but you're not separate from God. Realize that, realize that. But how do I realize that? Well, I'll give you some practices. So the sages gave us these practices. The practices known as yoga, pranayama, bandhas, mudras so around the time of the buddha so flash forward 2000 years to a sage named patanjali so this was 1700 years ago and those dates you guys oh my god wikipedia all the i was when exactly was patanjali's yoga sutras discovered when did patanjali as a sage write the yoga sutras so many different dates <coughs> it's roughly i'm going by what julian wrote because he's i know He's a Virgo like me. I know how thorough he is. So he wrote that part 1,700 years ago, around the time of Buddhism. So yoga is influenced by the Buddha. Tantra also. Jainism, is that how you say it, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Jainism. Jainism. So all of this was emerging as well. And then the sadhus were wandering around. You guys know who the sadhus are? So these guys. They were wandering around India. And I'll pass this book around. They had renounced life and said they were God-realized beings. They were finding God. They were finding the sacred in everything. So they would literally meditate all day. And you'll see them. You can still see them in India. They would meditate all day. They go to where they burn the bodies by the Ganges because they burn bodies in uh, India. When you die, you, get, you go to the Pari and you get burned because that's how you're supposed to do it. I don't know all the reasoning behind that. And then they rub the ashes of the dead all over them to renounce life, the impermanence. Life is impermanent. I am God. I am one with God. So these are the sadhus. And this is where we think the asanas started coming from. But they don't want to admit it because the sadhus were really cast down in India. And they were actually embarrassed when the British came over in the 1800s they were really embarrassed <coughs> in the sadhus. Because what are they doing? They're sitting around smoking grass. They've got the dreadlocks. They're putting the ashes of the dead all over them. They're piercing themselves. They're doing all kinds of crazy yoga postures. Here's a whole festival of, and like I said, I'll pass it around. And this is where a lot of the first yoga postures came from. So the sadhus actually date around that same time they covered themselves with the ashes of the dead, chanties and postures all day long. And then one theory is that they would be in deep states of meditation. And as they're meditating, and if you've ever done kundalini, you, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say this. We get sometimes spontaneous movements of the body. They're called kriyas. So different from the kriyas that I teach, a kriya is a spontaneous movement. So has anybody ever had that happen when you're meditating? If you're a deep meditator, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
So all of a sudden, boom, it's a Kriya. What's happening? Hmm. Yogi Bhajan, he dismissed a lot of that. But it's your chakras aligning. It's the energy moving. It's something get up, gets open. So there's actually a, a belief that the sadhus would be in these deep states, and then they would like pop into a posture. And that's where the postures came about. So isn't that interesting? Like they would just like do the, strike a pose. <laughs> that's where Madonna got that. So they would literally strike a pose. So that's one of the theories of where some of our postures came from. So spontaneously creating poses out of deep states of meditation. The first written account of yoga, as we might understand it, was around the fourth century. So as taught by Patanjali, he wrote 196 threads or sutras about concentration and meditation, how to merge with God, Atman, your soul. The only posture in all 196 yoga sutras, this is roughly 1,700 years ago, is what posture? This one. That's it. So where are the postures coming from, right? So now I'm like, ah. <laughs> So here I am spouting. It's a 5,000 year old tradition. It's a 5,000 year old tradition. It's a 5,000 year old tradition, right? So Patanjali wrote about these eight steps of yoga, the eight limbs. He was influenced by the Buddha as well. So he wrote these eight steps for how to merge with your soul. There are eight steps to merge with your soul and it's not triangle warrior two and warrior one. <laughs> as we might think it would be, right? So the yamas and the niyamas, so this is a moral code for how to be in your life. It's actually a way of life. Who knew? Yoga is a way of life. Practicing nonviolence or non-harming, ahimsa. Satya, being truthful with yourself and others. Asteya, non-stealing. Brahmacharya, sexual restraint, being responsible with your sexuality. Aparagraha, non-possessiveness, don't hoard, don't hold on to things. The niyamas, rules of personal behavior. Purity, keep yourself clean. Be content, santosha. Have some discipline or austerity. Svadvaya, spiritual studies. So studying, again, back to the jhana yoga. And then devotion to God. Devotion to a higher being, devotion to your soul, your higher self. Asana is the third limb. Yet in the West, that's what we think yoga is. One of the limbs refers to yoga postures, but in Patanjali's initial practice, it refers to mastering the body to sit still for meditation. The practice of yoga, yoga asanas came about eight centuries later, which helped disciples ready their bodies for meditation. So the only reason we do an asana practice is to be able to sit. And when I met you guys, I know I've been a yogi so many lifetimes because I have met three of these teachers. I met BKS Iyengar, I met TKV Desikachar, which we'll talk about in a minute, and I met Patavi Joyce. The three modern yoga masters, I met all of them in person. That's amazing to me. I like, and that kind of dawned on me last night too. So when I met Iyengar, he said, your asanas are your prayers to heal your body, because he had a lot of injuries. That's why he created the straps and the blocks and the a lot of uh, props in Iyengar yoga. And he says, but meditation delivers you to God. You do the asana to prepare your body to sit. That's it. Pra pranayama, breathing, controlling prana or life force. So prana is life force, right? Pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses. So the first thing we do in my classes, we close our eyes, pratyahara. Go inside. Go inside to your inner journey right now. Pratyahara. Dharana, concentrate. In Kundalini, we use the mantra. Satnam, Satnam. Concentrate on the mantra. Dhyana is when we get to that state of meditation where you lose time. It happens, I promise. You lose time. And maybe you've had that experience in a Hatha yoga class. You literally go, wow, I was just gone. And samadhi is merging with the divine. When you realize who you really are, you realize that you're one with God and that you are connected to the fabric of the entire planet and every single person on the planet. That's enlightenment. So that's what we refer to as yoga nowadays. 
is we are talking about Patanjali's Ashtanga Eight Limbs of Yoga. Asana is one limb. So that's, that's that. So even then, yoga is still referring to ways of being in your life, mudras, bandhas, pranayama. So again, where did we get all these postures? <laughs> Eighth century Buddhist texts refer to some asana as well, but we still don't have any archaeological evidence of written asanas, written postures. So 15th, somewhere in the 1400th century, a sage Goraksa and his teacher Matsindra write the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is 15 floor postures. One of them is Baddha Konasana, one of them is easy pose, one of them is a twist, one of them is Shavasana. <laughs> It's literally, it's 15 postures seated on the ground. That's the first evidence we have of any postures as we know them today was the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. And you can P Google it online and see the PDF of it if you want to check it out. It's pretty cool. Another, another evidence, the single archaeological discovery, a man seemingly seated in a yoga pose, which is Sukhasana, <laughs> was 2300 BC, and that's the Pushapati seal. So I wanted to give you kind of a visual what we're talking about. The first image ever of any yoga, archaeologically speaking, of a posture was 4300 years ago. And it's the Push, Pushapati seal. And it's this posture. So is, five, is, is yoga 5,000 years old? The Vedas, 3,700 years ago. The Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, an epic Hindu story taken from the Mahabharata, mentioning yoga, and the Hindu synthesis was 2,300 years ago. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, 1,700 years ago. Earliest textual reference to Hatha Yoga, Ha means sun, Tha means moon, balancing left and right sides of the body, the postures, was in Buddhist texts 1,300 years ago, and then the Hatha Yoga text, which was the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, 800 years ago. I'm oh, sorry, 600 years ago. <coughs> so where did Flip the Dog come from? <laughs> you guys know that one? <laughs> You're a down dog, you lift your leg, and you flip it behind you. <laughs> so. That's where we get. We get to modern yoga. Any questions so far? Are you having fun? Are you learning? Yeah? Fun stuff, huh? Super exciting. I did want to tell you another story because I'm doing great on time, I must say. When I went to India, well, I, I went to you know study. I went to see Sai Baba. I did all this great, amazing stuff that I was super lucky to do with an amazing guy I met on Twitter. Crazy story. I love social media. And... Um, and it was interesting because one of the women who went to study in India, because a lot of us go there to study, a lot of us seekers, a lot of us teachers, we, we have to go to India to study. We have to go see where it comes from. I went to Iyengar's uh, studio in Pune. I went to TKV, TKV Desika's Charge studio in, um, um, I think, Chennai. He's in Chennai. And, um, and when the guide picked up the woman, this other woman that went to India, told me this story, she said, she had a guide in India, this woman, and she said, oh, I'm so excited about studying yoga in India. And the woman said, I'd give anything to study yoga in LA. The Indian woman said that. Because guess where all the great teachers, well, in the 1960s and 1970s, all the teachers went to study in India and then came back here and started the first yoga studio, which was yoga, the yoga studio in Larchmont. It's the first one. So we have all the great teachers here. We have all the great teachers here. So it's pretty amazing. So modern yoga, 20th century India. The teachings of Teramalumlai Krishnamacharya. He was born in 1888 to 1989. He died at 101. So this is Krishnamacharya. This is when yo the yoga that we know started with this guy. So... Mysore, India. So that's his little picture. And then 
His son <coughs> was TKV Desikachar. That's this one. So the last one, TKV Desikachar. And then his brother, Patabi Joyce and Iyengar were cousins. So it's literally all from the same family. Wow. <laughs> so the ones I met, you guys, I met Iyengar. So the bottom picture on that page, I met Patabi Joyce and I met TKV Desikachar. So they call Iyengar the father of modern yoga. And that's this book, Light on Yoga. This is one of the first, this is the Bible of yoga. In, in, in every teacher training, this is the first book you get. This is called Light on Yoga. So in the 1960s and 1970s, many people from Los Angeles went to India to study with these masters and brought back the teachings and started all of their own teachings from there. And a big joke that, and, and you guys will get it now, because <laughs> as we understand yoga, when Flissa and I went to India, we were like, there's no yoga in India. There's no yoga in India. And we were laughing because it was all bhakti yoga. Every morning people would get up and do their prayers. People would make these beautiful mandalas at their front doors with chalk and flowers. People would chant all day long and pray. But there was no yoga in India. What were we telling you? There's no asana, there's no yoga studios, there's no nothing like we know it, nothing. And if you want to study the kundalini, don't even bother going to India, because it's all here. So, yoga to the west. What page are we on? I don't, my pages Five. don't, kind of fine. It is sad, I mean, isn't it? That's we sad that they don't have um, more guys, so that it's not And now world. that Patabi Joyce died in 2009, Desika Char died last year, all of them died now. And I mean, their institutes are still there. And then um, Iyengar died in 2014. And they were all in their 90s and 100s. I think Desikachar was a little younger, but yeah, they all passed away. I mean, they're, they're, their sons and daughters have carried on. I know Patabi Joyce's grandson, Sharath, now runs the yoga studio in, in um, Mysore. And I think Australia. initially yoga was for the elitists. Mm -hmm. And so the one, the teachers that came to the United States came so that they could get it out to the masses because they couldn't do that in India. That so is that's correct. that's why they came and shared the that is correct. of yoga and they didn't get it in India. Because of the caste system. Because of the caste Only system. Only the Brahmins were allowed mm -hmm. to practice yoga, wow. the meditations and study with the gurus. Mm -hmm. And Yogi Bhajan was a Brahmin. Mm -hmm. um, Yogananda was a Brahmin. All the big teachers were Brahmin, were in the, the higher class. Krishnamacharya, I'm sure, was a Brahmin, because that's the, isn't that the, the red on the face? Doesn't that mean Brahmin? Yeah, higher, so highest as class. As a woman, too, you would have never as a woman, been able yes. to do any of this that we do. Right, so, so true. And Yogi Bhajan's life was threatened for bringing us Kundalini. He had to have bodyguards the whole time he was here, and in Canada because they didn't want us to have the technology. So Yoga to the West, the first kind of, the first evidence um, I saw was Swami Vivekananda, who came here, he spoke in 1893, and you can actually Google his lecture, it's kind of cool, to see him speak at the Parmalin of World Religions and spoke about Vedanta philosophy, yoga and Vedanta as a spiritual philosophy that affirms the oneness of existence the divinity of the soul, and the harmony of all religions. So that was just groundbreaking at the time, right? Groundbreaking in the 1800s. So Swami Vivekananda opened people up to the possibility of what yoga was, which really opened up the door for Paramahansa Yogananda, who came here in the 20s. So this is, I studied this lineage for a long time. So you guys that come to my 9 a.m. Wednesday class, the mantras that I use in that class in English are from this lineage. I relax from outer involvement into my inner haven of peace. Um, what's another one? Catherine's memorizing them. I'm making a little cheat sheet for you guys, so I'll get that to you, I promise. I've just been so busy. No, and you guys, great story about his death. He had a maha samadhi. Maha means great, samadhi means death or oneness with God. He was at a lecture 
1952, gave a lecture, and then said it was time for him to go, and left his body. His body fell to the floor, and that was it. Wow. Mahasamadhi. I want to have a Mahasamadhi. <laughs> Not today. Not today. Not today, God. I have to Vox City. I have to be careful. Not today. There was a, a Goku teacher that died in South Bay in her class in, uh, in Shavasana. Yeah. It was a while ago, but yeah, I've heard the story. Where did she do? It was at the South Bay Club. Yeah, I knew some people that were in her class, and like, she, we, they all laid down for Shavasana, and she was gone. She had a Mahasamadhi. It was probably 10 years ago. So Yogananda came to the West in the 20s, Indian yogi. He re introduced millions to the teachings of meditation and Kriya Yoga. Not as we know in Kundalini, Kriya. Kriya Yoga, different. He taught energization exercises, which were about tensing and releasing, tensing and releasing to get your body ready for meditation. He taught a mantra where you sit and you chant Hung Sa, which means I am that. Interesting. Sat Nam, truth is my name. So they're all very similar mantras. Um, and then he went on to teach a little bit more of the postures. So again, it all started with this guy, Krishnamacharya. So Yogananda was a guru. So if you want to read, if you're really interested in yoga, read Autobiography of a Yogi. He's not doing any down dogs, any warriors. <laughs> And he's a total yogi. And it talks about his relationship with God and Guru. It's a really, really powerful book. This book changed my life. I read this like in 1998. It's changed so many people's lives. So Krishnamacharya. So Yogananda, okay, I failed. This is so interesting because I did. I literally did not mean to do this, you guys. So Yogananda was one of eight. And his tiniest brother, Bikram, was Bikram's guru. I left Bikram out. He's having all these sexual harassment charges against him right now. He's in all this litigation. He lost billions of dollars. He had like, so it's a big scandal right now, Bikram yoga. But that's the Bikram yoga Hot that you yoga. see every year. Hot yoga. I was reading, yeah. he kept trying to hide all his assets and he has like this multi-billion dollar. Oh, that's not good karma. Karma collection. That's bad. Yeah, Yogi Bhajan says that if you screw up as a teacher, like you come back as a cockroach, like you're done, yeah. you're done. If you're a teacher and you go bad, it's bad. <laughs> oh God, that's terrible. Yeah, so, and, and it's crazy because I left him out of the lecture and then I'm like, I forgot Bikram, oh my God. <laughs> but Bishnu, which was his littlest brother, he was a gymnast and like into working out and everything. So Yogananda told him, oh yeah, go to the West and teach some of that stuff. And Bikram was studying under him, so that's how Bikram's empire got started, was in the 1960s, Bikram uh, Chowdhury um, studied yoga as a form of exercise, <coughs> the asanas, and created his 26 postures, which I think he got copyrighted? He tried to. He tried to, but they said you can't copyright yoga, yeah, which is great for us as kundalini yogis. Yeah. But weren't the studios, the hot now they, their they had to rename it because Bikram threatened to sue them if they, they didn't use his name. If they used his name and didn't pay him. Right. So if you used his name and his image, you had to give him, it's like a franchise. You had to give, I get that, you had to give him money, the percentage of your profits. Oh, so he couldn't, okay, he couldn't copyright the actual. No, no, it went to all the way to the Supreme it. Court. I'm not sure exactly how it could have been out. Yeah, I think somehow. But you can't copyright yoga, right. is what or they're saying. Exact yeah. So that was Yogananda, and Yogananda started Self Realization Foundation. It's still in Pacific Palisades. Gandhi's ashes are there. I highly recommend going. Go to a lecture there. It's beautiful. And uh, and then there's the one in Encinitas. That's right, the Ananda Yoga. And then his disciple Swami Kriyananda, which I didn't include a picture of either, because again, it's a, it's a different lineage. He had a huge split with the SRF people. So isn't it interesting with all the uh, yoga and one with God, all so the competition political. and all the political and taking people to court and it's going on in the Kundalini tradition as well right now. That's so good. Yeah, no, we're human. 
what are we gonna do? <laughs> so then there's Swami Shivananda, and he started the Divine Life Society and became very popular in the West. He wrote 296 books on yoga philosophy, psychology, ethics, health, and many of his disciples created centers around the world. So tons of people study Shivananda techniques. Um, Shivananda is awesome. I have a Shivananda book, and it's actually one of the earliest yogas I studied was Shivananda, like back, back 25 years ago, was Shivananda's work. And of course, I had to put Yogi Bhajan in, you guys. <laughs> And there's Yogi Bhajan. So Yogi Bhajan came here in uh, 1969 to create teachers and not followers. He said, the guru is in you, not outside of you. Stop worshiping in a person. Mm -hmm. The gurus are the teachings. Yeah. He introduced the practice of kundalini yoga meditation, a powerful technology very different from hatha yoga. So actually, if you go back to asana, you guys, and like the Vedas and the hot, all of that, it's more like kundalini. Yes, because in Kundalini, what are we focused on? We're focused on seated postures, moving the spine, breathing, chanting, dristi, mudra. So it's more of the original yoga. Preparing to meditate. <laughs> and then we sit and meditate, exactly. So that's why it feels more real to me. So he created the 3HO, Happy, Healthy, Holy. He said the practice was given to him from Sikh gurus, mainly Guru Nanak, who was the, tenth, um, the first in the line of the 10 Sikh gurus, and his teacher, Sant Haraza Singh. He became the master of Kundalini Yoga at age 16. He wrote hundreds of books on psychology of being human, which really resonated for me, because God knows, after I went to the ashram with Sai Baba for three days, I was like, I can't live in an ashram because it was terrible <laughs> so he he's more he was more concerned thousands of teachers and practitioners all over the world Yogi Bhajan said the guru is in you realize you're the one realize it becomes so bright that others are uplifted just by your presence isn't that beautiful don't get your down dog perfect don't try to get your leg behind your head like at some point after so many years of practicing, I practiced, I practiced Ashtanga Yoga, which is from the Patabi Joyce lineage. This is what Madonna does. So it's one of the most difficult yogas. And I mean, it's so, I mean, I was a dancer, so I came, but it's so challenging. And you start with the primary series. And you have to master all the postures in the primary series. And then, you know, I mean, look at that really intensely physical and they realized that a lot of the early postures that Patabi Joyce created Krishna Machara created came from British calisthenics it came from the British bringing over books in the 1800s and they had pictures of Krishna Machara with the princess at the palace of Mysore and they didn't want to be associated with these guys right Ooh. So they got cameras and said, hey, put together a nice something and work with the princess. So he started looking at pictures of like Danish and British calisthenics. Mm -hmm. It was a huge boom in the 1930s mm -hmm. of working out. And, and, and so it's so interesting because they said that's where a lot of these postures came from. So this isn't a lot of posture. Um, it's the Iyengar book. Where's the Iyengar book? Oh, here. Um, so they literally, if you look at the book, The Yoga Body by Mark Singleton, he has pictures of Iyengar next to the British guy from the calisthenics book doing the exact postures. And then, oh, so that's, that's where they're saying asana comes from. 1930s. He was kind of... The, both. Oh, so they were collaborating. Yes, they were collaborating and they started wow. doing films and pictures from the 1930s. And that was like the beginning of the explosion of yoga. And then Yogananda came, Vivekananda came to the West. And then uh, Yogananda's brother came, Bikram. And then Bikram kind of started on the East Coast. And out here, um, Ganga White from White Lotus Foundation, a lot of the teachers in Los Angeles went to India 
and started studying with um, Patabi Joyce, this guy. So he came up with the Ashtanga series, which is a series of 76 postures that you do every morning at sunrise. And then people were like, oh, I have too many injuries. So then they started going to Iyengar, two very different schools of yoga, but they studied with the same guy who was Desika Char's father. And they were cousins. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's like all from the same family. Um, and then people came back from India and started changing it adding stuff, taking stuff away. We did have, we have one more minute. And um, that's what became power yoga, ba Baron Baptiste. He studied with, um, I think, Bikram and, and um, Batabi Joyce. So he started power yoga, vinyasa flow. And then Desika Char said, no, too many injuries. You need to add the Vedas. You need to add the chanting. You need to add the breathing. You need to add the pranayama. Forget the asana. When we went to study with him in India, he said, don't give them asana. We met him briefly. He put us with his top teacher. He said, teach him a Vedic chant. It's on YouTube. I have it. He taught us a Vedic chant. He did not teach us asana. So if you want to come to Kundalini Yoga 101 next, <laughs> that's a whole nother lineage. Whole nother, whole nother thing. So my advice, if you're looking for yoga practice, if you want to go deep on the path, you've got to choose a path. Because otherwise, it's just so much out there. You really have to decide, what am I going to study? And these are great paths. I mean, Ananda is a wonderful path. Um, and, and one of my dear friends, Turiya, teaches um, over here at Meditation Unlimited on Kaya Mayor studied with him for years. I taught at Ananda Yoga Center for years. So um, Iyengar Yoga, Life Yoga, Michael is amazing. He, he's phenomenal. So if you really want to get into a lineage, study with a teacher who's done the work, who's really studied, who knows their stuff, you know? <coughs> and um, yeah. And if you want a family tree, there's more. This is only, you guys, this is only the beginning. <laughs> But I guess my biggest takeaway is don't be afraid to go to yoga. Go to yoga for beginners. Just show up and do what you can do. That's what it's about. It's, it's not about the posture. It's about your breath. It's about being present and learning to love yourself. Like the sadhus. <laughs> so, yeah. So the... This is probably where most of our asanas come from. And kundalini is a whole nother story, right? Mm -hmm. It's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's just um, bring our hands together. And we're going to chant Om. So Om is the sound of consciousness, it's the symbol of the, it looks like a three, and it has a little um, dot and a curve on it. So Om is, reminds us of who we truly are, it's a vibration. So just take a big inhale. Oh. And I'm so grateful for this practice, for all of these teachers who have come before us, who have passed down this sacred, ancient knowledge to this moment. And may it keep, keep evolving as we evolve. Namaste. I hope you enjoyed it, you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. You snuck in a lot of information.